Welcome. The IPCC has just released a draft version of its assessment report. This is the sixth assessment report that it has done. And this video is a summary of 20 of the major conclusions from that report taken from the section that is called a summary for policymakers. So it's a relatively straightforward and simple section. There is overall nearly 4,000 pages, which I have yet to wade through. So there's probably a lot more detail in there than I have got in this video, but we don't want a video that goes on for hours and hours. So anyway, here goes. A member of the UN has labeled this assessment report as Code Red for Humanity. This is the sixth assessment report. It was released earlier this week. And it shows many of the predictions made in the fifth assessment report uh, as being wrong. Now, at the time, the fifth assessment report was hailed by the climate denialists as being overly alarmist and inaccurate. Well, it is indeed wrong, but not in the way that they thought. It seems that many of their conclusions were too conservative, underestimating the rise in global temperatures, the rise in sea level and the rate of ice melt. The first conclusion is that we humans are in fact responsible for this mess. The report states it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere and ocean and land. Average global temperature anomaly is plus 1.07 degrees centigrade. That's measured with respect to the 1850 to 1900 baseline. When you're doing temperature anomalies, you have to define a baseline to measure it with respect. This is a good period to use because for those 50 years, the temperatures were basically stable with no trend in them, but just uh, going up and down with things like El Nino and La Nina. They point to the fact that greenhouse gases have been rising. It's now carbon dioxide is now at 410 parts per million. Methane is 1.9, basically two parts per million, and nitrous oxide 0.03 parts per million. Now, these other two, methane and nitrous oxide, don't seem to be that important compared with carbon dioxide. However, they're much stronger greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. So they actually contribute quite a bit to the issue. The second conclusion is, rather obviously, it's getting hotter. Each of the last four decades has been successively warmer than any of the decade that preceded it since 1850. You can see that here on the right hand side of the plot. And one thing to note here for those that are in love with the 1930s, uh, they are nothing special in this plot. They're just part of the overall process, pretty much near average. So the 1930s were nothing special except for in a small part of the United States. The third conclusion is we're getting more rain. Rainfall has increased since 1950. Mid-latitude storm tracks have likely shifted poleward in both the hemispheres since the 1980s. The fourth conclusion is we're losing ice. It says human influence is very likely the main driver of global retreat of glaciers since 1990. The uh, also it's responsible for the decrease in Arctic sea ice area. There's been no significant change in the Antarctic sea ice area. There's been a decrease in Northern Hemisphere snow cover since the 1950s. It concludes that the oceans are heating. Global upper ocean, that's the top 700 meters of the ocean, has warmed since the 1970s. It is virtually certain that human caused carbon dioxide emissions are the main driver of the current global acidification of the surface of the open ocean. Oxygen levels have dropped in many upper ocean regions since the mid 20th century. The next conclusion is that sea level is increasing. Global mean sea level has increased by 0.2 meters between 1901 and 2018. The rate of sea rise has accelerated from about 1.9 millimeters per year to 3.7 millimeters per year. The next conclusion is that global warming is here and now. It's not something that we look forward to in the future. It's actually happening right now. 
Climate zones, for example, have shifted poleward in both hemispheres. The growing season on average has lengthened by up to two days per decade since the 1950s in the Northern Hemisphere. The eighth conclusion is that what we're seeing is unprecedented. Here we have a plot of global temperatures as a function of time for the last 2000 years. The gray area is the uncertainty on that number. The black area on the right shows the modern measurement. The others are all done by proxies. You can see the medieval warming period. You can see the little ice age. But there's a very th important thing to note here, and that's this little bar on the left. This shows the warmest ended period uh, over the last 100,000 years. And if we draw a line for across from where we are now, we have exceeded that. So you could say that what we're experiencing now is the worst temperatures for the last 100,000 years, not just the last 100 years, but 100,000 years. That's significant. And therefore, this is unprecedented. Also, we have here a attribution. You can model how much the natural changes are, and that's this blue area down the bottom right. Uh, but then uh, that doesn't explain what you observed, which is the black line. If you add in human and natural together, you get the brown line up here, and that fits the data very well. So it says you basically need that human contribution in order to explain the temperature seeing, otherwise you can't. And that natural uh, curve includes both solar and volcanic activity. One of the things that has been noted is that the warming that we have is much greater uh, in actuality than what we've seen. And that's because aerosols that we produce are actually cooling the climate, particularly the NOx and sulfur dioxide. So the warming of the planet is shown here on the right, where the overall warming is that red bar on the far left of the curve. The actual warming that's gone on is the next curve to it, so it's actually bigger, but that's been offset by other human drivers, which is mainly these aerosols. Please note the relatively insignificant roles of solar and volcanic drivers to the climate and also internal variability. Our 10th conclusion is extremes becoming more extreme. Hot extremes have become more frequent and more intense across most land regions since the 1950s while cold extremes have become less frequent and less severe. Marine heat waves have approximately doubled in frequency since the 1980s. Next, we have droughts and rain. Human-induced climate change is increasing in agricultural regions. Ecological droughts in some regions due to increased land evapotranspiration. The frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events have also increased since the 1950s in most land areas. Our 12th conclusion is about tropical storms and the fact that they are increasing. The proportion of major, that's category 3 to 5 tropical cyclones, has increased over the last four decades. The latitude where tropical cyclones in the western and northern Pacific reach their peak intensity has shifted northward. No significant trend in the overall numbers of tropical storms. So there's still about the overall same number, but more of them are becoming more intense or major storms. Conclusion 13, unlucky for some, um, is there's more compound events. This is where two or more factors come together to create a particularly nasty a piece of weather. For example, increases in frequency of concurrent heat waves and droughts on the global scale have occurred. Fire weather in some regions, that would be a combination of low humidity winds and high temperatures. And compound flooding is also increasing in some locations. 
One conclusion is definitely this is a global effect, it's not a series of local effects. For example, high temperatures are just about everywhere in the globe with high confidence. The red areas here are indicating that there is high temperature and the number of dots indicate the certainty of that particular conclusion. You see most of these are very high certainty, three dots. Then we go to precipitation, and there are some areas uh, in the US and South America, but it seems mainly in Europe and Asia where these major events are occurring. And drought, there's less of that around, but, but the Western North America certainly has been had a problem. Some parts of South America, again, Europe around the Mediterranean and Southern Africa. Um, China seems to be having problems and also Southern Australia. The 15th conclusion is this is mainly due to greenhouse gases. Human caused radiative forcing is 2.72 watts per meter squared in 1919 relative to 1750 and has therefore warmed the climate. Radiative forcing has increased by 90% relative to the previous assessment report. And 79% of that is due to increase in greenhouse gases since 2011. Later, that is due to a better understanding of the role of aerosols in the program. The remainder of that is due to the better understanding of the role of aerosols in the problem. Conclusion 16 is about attribution, and I'm sorry, it's us. Human caused increase in radiative forcing causes accumulation of additional energy heating in the climate system. Most of the energy went into the oceans, that's 91%. 5% went into heating the land, 3% into melting ice, and 1% into heating the atmosphere. The oceans are rising. The climate system has caused global mean sea level to rise from 1971 to 2018. 50% of that is due to thermal expansion. 22% is ice loss from glaciers. 20% from ice loss from ice sheets and the other 8% is changes in water storage on land. The rate of ice sheet loss is increased by a factor of four between 1992 uh, to 1999 and 2010 to 2019. That's quite a stunning increase. The areas that the last report underestimated was the climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is a combination of the increase in carbon dioxide in uh, greenhouse gases and also that results in feedbacks like increased humidity in the air, which uh, means that the additional water vapor is also uh, an increasing greenhouse gas. They now estimate the equilibrium climate sensitivity is somewhere between two and five degrees centigrade with a best estimate of three degrees centigrade and an uncertainty on that of plus or minus 0.5. This is all based on multiple lines of evidence, just not one measurement at all. And it's compared to the estimate of the previous assessment report, which was 1.5 to 4.5, but they didn't give a, a best estimate. And most people took that to be about 2 to 2.5. Most people took that to be 2 to 2.5. The report looks at a bunch of different scenarios as to what's contributing to uh, heating the planet, uh, particularly looking out to, into the future. And they have five particular scenarios which uh, contribute to uh, the warming. Now, the panel on the left here is carbon dioxide, and note that the scale here is measured in gigatons per year. On the other three greenhouse gases on the right, they are measured in millions of tons per year. And you can see that these are the possible scenarios for them. The yellow one here is approximately what we're hoping to get, which is uh, relatively stable emissions until 2050, and then a sharp reduction. Um, I think the red one is probably about what we're doing now, and the purpley one is uh, probably, let's just dig up everything we can and burn it. 
This is what the resulting temperature changes would be for those five different scenarios. The most optimistic scenario would keep our temperatures under 1.5 degrees centigrade increase. That's um, what's been desired by the uh, climate community. The second scenario would keep it about just under two degrees centigrade, which is a problem, but nonetheless far less of a problem than what we're heading for. Uh, what it would seem that we would be heading for if we don't do very much is between 2.5 and uh, 4.5 degrees centigrade increase in temperatures. And that would be, uh, by most people's estimates, disastrous. One is the melting of the permafrost, which would produce a lot of methane. Another is a loss of seasonal snow cover. A loss of land ice and Arctic sea ice, which reduces the albedo. And these effects could last for centuries, if not millennia, which is the frightening part of all of this. And this is if we do something. If we don't do something, it just gets worse. What can we conclude from all of this? Well, this is the work of several thousand climate experts. So if you hear anybody decrying this report, remember that the people writing this report are indeed the experts. People who are decrying it are not. This summary is only an extract from the briefing for policymakers. There are another 3,900 pages to look through, and I haven't done that yet. So there's probably a lot more detail I'm missing here. It does not include the unnecessarily, in my opinion, complicated confidence ratings that uh, the IPCC came up with. Um, and so if you want to understand that better, and get some more of the details that I've omitted, read the report for yourself. It's, it's fascinating and very worrying. So until next time, stay safe and goodbye.